Dr. Rosie Ward, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have a nice conversation with you today. Uh, you join us from Salvio Partners, LLC, a consulting and professional development firm. Uh, I'll share a little bit more about that and uh, share your bio with listeners in just a moment. But before we dive on in, I just wanted to introduce the topic for today. You do a lot of work around this idea of rehumanizing the workplace, with which I really love as a framing. Uh, I think there's so much there to unpack. So we're going to be exploring together what that means, what that looks like, how we can go about doing it as leaders within our organizations, within our sphere of influence, how we can rehumanize our teams and the workplace and help everyone to have the opportunity to, to be successful, to be productive, innovative, and really just to thrive in what they do. As we get started, I wanted to share Rosie's bio with everybody. Dr. Rosie Ward began her career in 1994 in the fitness industry as a group fitness instructor and personal trainer. She earned a bachelor's degree in kin uh, kin is, I can't say that word. Kinesiology. <laughs> kinesiology. Uh, she earned a bachelor's degree in kinesiology and a master's degree in public health with a focus on worksite health promotion. She became disheartened, however, when she realized the way we approached Supporting employee wellness didn't really work, and she knew she needed to find a better path. After personally experiencing the ill effects of a toxic work environment, she was inspired to shift gears and completed her PhD in organization and management, where she focused on organizational culture, leadership, and coaching. She started to see how incredibly interconnected our own health and well-being are with the organizations where we work. After holding various leadership and consulting roles, she co-founded Salvio Partners, LLC, and the firm is dedicated to rehumanizing workplaces so organizations and their people can thrive. I just really love everything about uh, your background. I love the path and the journey you've been on as you've tried to figure out both for yourself, but also for organizations and, and their teams, you know, just how to be better, more authentic, uh, and that we, we can work uh, in, in an environment where everyone has the opportunity to be their best selves. I think that's just so important. That's a passion that I share with you. I'm super excited to, to uh, have this dialogue with you today. Before we dive on into the conversation, anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of background or personal context? No, I think, I think that's great. I was laughing when you were saying quite the background. I, I obviously usually say it's a squiggly line. It's never a straight line to get the right detours, but it's been kind of fun to see how it all comes together. So, yeah, I think that's right. And, and that's similar, uh, to my background. Um, I think most people don't have a linear, a uh, perfectly linear upward path. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're, no. we're, we're all over the place most of the time and, and that's what makes life fun and, and worth the journey. Right. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Excellent. So as we get started, um, I thought we could, we could really begin with you just defining what you mean by rehumanizing the workplace uh, based on your experiences, being in a toxic work environment, understanding employee well-being and how that's not really fully addressed in how most organizations approach it. Uh, what does rehumanizing the workplace mean to you? And then we can get into some of the guiding principles around rehumanizing the workplace. Sure. As you said, there's a lot to unpack. So I think at its core for me, rehumanizing the workplace means that we are creating the conditions, whether people physically go into a workplace or they're virtual or anything in between, where people truly can show up authentically. They can be human, meaning, you know what? No human is perfect. I can make mistakes. I can learn. I can grow. And I have an opportunity to really bring my best self into my work. And I still have fuel left in my tank, so to speak, where I am not burnt out, not wiped out emotionally or physically. And I still have room to bring my best self back into my personal life and contribute to my family and my community. And that really workplaces are nurturing that. And so that's really, there's a lot that goes into that, but that's really for me, how I view what a human workplace is. And what's interesting is, yes, my own personal experience sparked this. And so, you know, out of struggle, you know, comes, hey, this, this purpose. And I became even more passionate about it when I started to look at people who are actually researching this. So in our book, we quote Jeffrey Pfeffer's research from Stanford, and this was pre-pandemic, but that 
literally in the United States alone, toxic workplaces are the fifth leading cause of death and account for 8% of our healthcare spend. But what organizations have done, largely I will say, when the Affordable Care Act was put into place and the wellness provisions were put in there, that they thought, oh, you know what? Our healthcare costs are going up because employees don't eat enough broccoli or they're not getting enough steps. And so they started putting these horrible, horrible wellness programs that are not founded in good science, that have been proven to be ineffective, that treat people like predictable, controllable machines and rodents and like little children and people hate them and thinking that, oh, if we just get them to change these health behaviors that, but we don't have to fix the fact that we overwork them, that we don't have good project management, that we have poor leadership, that our culture sucks, but you know what, go fix yourself. You know, so that's, so it's just, it's all backwards. And so, and so this interconnectedness that you can't have an organization that at its core is unhealthy and expect your people that it's not going to suck the well-being out of them. I mean, I've experienced it. I've had friends who've experienced it. And you can take a emotionally, physically, spiritually, you name it, healthy person and put them in an environment like that and it, it won't do so well. And you can have an environment and a culture that's really, really wonderful. And if, but if they aren't supporting their employees and being able to give their gifts and show up as their best self and recognizing when they're human and they're struggling, that's not going to be helpful long. They go hand in hand. And so I really think human workplaces recognize that interconnectedness and they try to foster the organizational health and well-being as well as the individual health and well-being. And it's not about kale and CrossFit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for a little bit of background to that. And as you're saying that, I was just reflecting on a couple of the really frustrating places I've been <laughs> in the yeah. in the past. I think we've all had those experiences, unfortunately. And it, it truly is unfortunate because it doesn't have to be that way. Right. Um, but I think people default to tradition. They default to what they've seen in the past. Most leaders who find themselves in like formal leadership roles in various levels of management don't have a lot of background and actual leadership skills and competencies. They just find themselves in those positions because they were good at their previous job and then they got promoted, um, yep. which doesn't necessarily mean anything for their ability to lead a team or to, to be effective on a larger scale um, uh, yeah. as they try to, to harness the, the energies of a whole variety of people and the expertise of a bunch of different people. And so you end up with very commonly toxic environments or at the very least, you know, unhealthy, unproductive environments. And it doesn't mean that the leaders are evil or that they have even bad intentions. It just means that most people don't really know what they're doing. And so they, they just are doing the best they know how um, based on their own experience and what they've seen other people do, maybe a book they read or, or whatever, and, and they don't do the kind of the basic uh, consistent things that need to happen over time to, to develop and maintain and sustain a really healthy, um, psychologically safe culture, a place where people can be bring their whole authentic self into the workplace, where they can truly be who they are. Um, and where we're not constantly trying to squeeze every last little ounce of productivity out of somebody um, with the hope that that'll make us look good in the short run without any thought to what that means for that individual or our team in the long run. Because uh, oh, clear, clearly that's not a sustainable approach. Absolutely. And you hit on a few really important things that I think organizations, again, no, no, no malintent. Certainly there are those horrible leaders, but a lot of times it's like, yeah, I was good at being an accountant or a physician or a salesman, and now you make me a leader, but you don't develop me in how to do it. And I'm used to being the go-to person. So either I'm going to clamp down on control or take over. And it's just because it's what I know and it's where I feel successful. And, and I love, I don't know if you're familiar with, you know, Bob Anderson and Bill Adams. So they wrote Mastering Leadership and Scaling Leadership, but I love how they refer to the inner game and the outer game of leadership. So the inner game is our emotional intelligence and our identity and our meaning making system and all of those things in the outer game are the skills and the competencies and they both matter but the inner game runs the outer game and what we need is a really good solid inner game and a refined outer game but most if I become a leader what do I do I send you to a management 101 class on how to communicate that's the outer game but you know what my inner game to use Brene Brown's language I'm armored up I'm in self-protective mode I feel like a fraud I have imposter syndrome I'm trying to hide my inadequacies and all of that crap shows up and in the last year it's shown up even worse because the pandemic has put everybody into a space they've never been before and so they double down on what's familiar they double down on what feels comfortable 
armor goes up left and right, and then you have dehumanization that skyrockets even even worse. Yeah, I think that's right. And it, I, I think the pandemic has really shown a spotlight on um, both great leaders who just really have risen to the challenge of, of just this really unique time and space, you know, where we're trying to deal with um, shifts to virtual work and supporting people, showing more empathy. It, there have definitely been people that have risen to the challenge uh, and have, have been exceptional. But there's been a whole lot of people, probably most people, um, where that same spotlight, you know, has has been focused on them, and it's just demonstrated the gaps, the huge, huge gaps that exist. Again, no ill intent. Uh, often, um, with with these individuals, they just don't know what they're doing. They're in over their head, and they're doing the best they know how. And and we just need to be able to do better. So, so organizations do need to invest in their people. They need, do need to invest in leadership development, not just surface level stuff, not just, um, you know, check in the box to say they've done the training, but truly over time trying to, de to develop the, the capacities and capabilities um, of, of their people that's what needs to happen so that when you do face a crisis, you do, when you do face something like a global pandemic or, or disruptive shifts in your industry or whatever the case may be, that you, can, that you won't buckle to the pressure of what often happens. And that is the people in the organization do become dehumanized. They are seen as cogs in a machine. They're seen as expendable. Um, they're no longer invested in, which always kind of is strange to me because we invest in other forms of capital uh, without a second thought. But for whatever reason, when we have to invest in people, we somehow think that's a, just a sunk cost that, that we're wasting our money. Um, but we, we end up, we end up exploiting people. We end up treating them horribly and we feel justified in doing it. Um, yeah. And, and, and that I've just seen so many unfortunate examples of that in the past year of otherwise people that I would say were really good, um, ethical, moral people that end up really exploiting um, people on their team and people in their organization because they feel like they have no choice. You always have a choice. You always have a choice. And, and uh, if, you, if you have the skills and competencies to lead well, and you, you make the decision that you're going to treat people as human beings, as people, then you can work through those challenges that you're going to face. Oh yeah, they'll be your biggest advocates. And I've seen this with different groups that we work with that, you know, even if they've had to do partial furloughs or, you know, make some of the difficult decisions they had to, but they've done it in a humane way. And because they've been anchored on a clear purpose and they treat their people well, not that they're perfect, but people are willing to rally behind them because it's more of this, we're all in this together and better, you know, we all suffer a little bit than any one of us suffer greatly. And there's this shared mentality and that's very different. And then, or even those that had to like, let people go but if they treated them well, man, when they're willing to come back versus those that didn't. And as stuff opens back up, they are struggling to rehire people because they're like, oh, hell no, I'm not going back there. And I have options or I'd rather sit and collect unemployment right now than go back to that because my life's not worth that. Um, and I've even seen other people throughout the pandemic where you know, people who ended up going to work remotely are working more hours, are more burnt out because they don't have the commute and they don't have to, you know, go between buildings or whatnot. And that organizations are really, unfortunately, to your point, exploiting that, some of them, not all of them, right? But I've seen those for people around me who are doing that and people are burning out and they're starting to look for jobs and they're starting to say, I will take a pay cut because I have learned over the course of this last year that my life is worth more than this and this isn't this is insanity and this isn't worth it. So I think as things continue to kind of rebound and open back up and we figure out whatever this next normal is, I do think that those organizations, I, I think that challenges reveal who we are, right? You said some people rise to the occasion and not that there's not bumps and bruises. And I think that the true character of individuals and the true character of organizations collectively has been revealed more and more. And I think that um, those that really don't think that they need to treat their people like human beings are going to find themselves struggling, unfortunately. And there's an opportunity they can turn around, but it might be a bumpy road. Yeah. And, and you know, once you've, sh you've shown your cards as someone who doesn't 
see your people as worthy of investment or treating with dignity and respect, that's a hard thing to walk back <laughs> and to reestablish that trust, right? Um, oh, yeah. It's, and you have social really... media everywhere. You got glass door, whatever, like, guess what? Your reputation is now out there. So you've got some serious damage control to do. Yeah. And it's, 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 you can really quickly and easily undermine your own credibility and demolish trust <laughs> in your organization and how people view the, the leadership team and the executive team. Um, rebuilding that trust is just really hard. Um, mm -hmm. for, and that's for people in the organization where you control the messaging. If you, once you get outside the organization, you're trying to attract good people, man, the, the, the horse is out of the barn there. And, and that's going to be a really difficult thing. It's going to be very expensive. It's going to be very time consuming and a, di a difficult thing to, to reshape your reputation. Um, so, Man, there's just so many cool things we can talk about in relation to this. <laughs> um, I, I was I was thinking of we'll we'll get into the the guiding principles here uh, in just a moment, but I was thinking of just the relationship uh, that kind of the the how this relates to like dating. Um, I have teenage daughters, right? I I want them to be treated respectfully by those that they go out on dates with. Um, and so you, you have the guy who, who, you know, strings them along, doesn't return their calls or texts, makes them wait, honks the car, honks the horn outside while they're waiting for, uh, to pick them up and, and just expecting for my daughter to go out, you know, it d doesn't open the door for him. I mean, so maybe some of this is antiquated, um, behaviors, you know, that I would hope that a gentleman would do, but the bottom line is I want them to treat my daughters well. I want them to treat them with respect, right? They are deserving of that respect. Uh, and if if my daughter is with a guy who can't do that, who can't like even like the, the base level kind of expectation of just dignity and respect, they shouldn't waste their time with them. Uh, and the, it's, it's just going to lead to other frustrations and other pain. And the same thing with organizations. If, if your boss, your direct line manager or the organization as a whole has a culture where they just don't treat people well, they don't trust their people, um, they don't respect their time, they, don't, uh, they, they try to squeeze every last down of productivity out of them, um, there's a toxic environment. If that's the case, man, just like I'm a dad to a teenage daughter and I want them to, to have a better situation, I would say the same thing to anyone working in that kind of environment. Get out of there. Go somewhere else. You're worth more. You're worth being treated better. And we have to remember our, our innate value as human beings. Yeah, you know, as you say that, it totally reminds me of the story that Bob Chapman, the CEO of Barry Waymuller, always tells and that he had this insight and it was at a friend's wedding and he was talking about the moment when the, the father of the bride is walking the bride down the aisle and the minister turns and says, you know, who gives who gives this person to be married? And he said, you know, it's really like, I'm, I'm trusting you to basically take care of my daughter, right? You're not going to treat her poorly. And so their whole mantra is everybody is somebody's pre precious child. Right. So at work, like, you don't, we don't, we wouldn't want our children treated this way. Like if my, I mean, part of why I'm so passionate about this, I have a 10 year old and in, I've had two toxic work experiences. And the second one that I had almost broke me. And my son was three and I watched him when I would come home trying to keep it together and falling apart and crying at the dinner table. And, and like, he started biting kids at daycare and he was this loving, I mean, like you can't help it. It has a ripple effect. And I just think about I don't ever want my son to have to go through what I've been through. You know, not only do I want him treated well on dates and whatever, but I, I don't want him to have to go through that. So why can't, you know, just like you, you want your daughters treated well on dates, like everybody is somebody's precious child. And, and these people are entrusted in our care within organizations. So why don't we treat them as if they're somebody's precious child? Why do we treat them as if they're expendable because they made a mistake? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's talk now about more uh, around what leaders can do uh, to be able to rehumanize. Uh, so the guiding principles that I know you talk a lot about that you can define and explain a little bit for us, uh, build a lighthouse, create fearless environments, wade in the messy middle, show up as a leader, find your tribe. 
Uh, maybe walk us through those those guiding principles. What do they mean? How can we utilize those principles as leaders in our organizations to really take the bull by the horn and, and work to rehumanize our workplace? And we may be in a situation where you know, our little sphere of influence is isolated and the broader organizational culture is not great. We may, you know, we can try to do that internal work to, to influence that and adjust it over time. But we certainly have our sphere of influence, you know, down here in our, with our team that we can start doing these things immediately. So walk us yeah. through that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I will say, I'm so glad you pointed that out because in our book, Rehumanizing the Workplace, we talk about this, that ultimately psychological safety and culture reside at that local team level. And so even if you don't have a formal people leadership title, like we all can show up as leaders and we all can have that influence. So the build a lighthouse principle is really this whole idea of think about what a lighthouse does. It cuts through the fog. It guides our way when the waters get stormy and the seas get rough. And so the lighthouse principle is on the organizational level, but also on the individual level, do you actually truly have clarity of purpose? Not these wordy mission vision statements, but like truly like, do you get do you, why you're here? What's your purpose? Like our purpose is to rehumanize the workplace, right? And that's very, very clear. And that acts as a filter that guides what we do. And, and then on top of that, have you actually operationalized your core values? So again, on an organizational and an individual level, words on a wall or words on a website don't mean anything. Have you defined what are the behaviors that are aligned? What are the behaviors that are out of alignment? And so you have guideposts. And that means you, you onboard people to those, you create deliberate practices to keep them alive. Like they are living, breathing filters for how you show up. I will tell you, when we talk about the people who've risen to the occasion this past year, I would will, be willing to bet that the organizations and individuals that have, have that lighthouse. Because that's what, I will tell you, I, I anchor myself in that multiple times a week, multiple times a day. It's like, okay, how do I want to show up? How am I going to approach this? Well, you know what? If I do this, I'm going to show up as the best version of me. Or as I do this, we're going to be in integrity as an organization. So that's the lighthouse um, principle. And there's a lot that goes into it, but um, it's, it's, it's like, again, it's that beacon of light that points, points north. Um, and so then the second pr principle, create fearless environments, is really all about psychological safety. So psychological safety is not about unicorns and rainbows. This is about we are willing to lean in and have the tough conversations. We're willing to ask for help. We're willing to give help. We're willing to speak up. We're willing to say, I don't know. Um, and do we create an environment where people can show up real and say, hey, I'm struggling today. Hey, my kids, you know, I'm homeschooling or you know what, I'm overwhelmed. Like that we can ask for what we need. We can speak up. We can share our ideas. Um, and so we've got to create environments where people feel safe to show up human and real and then support um, one another. And, and are we creating that? So there's a lot that goes into that, but that's the second principle. The third weight in the messy middle goes along with what we were talking about earlier with the inner game versus the outer game. Weight in the messy middle is really about that inner game. Like there is not a fast forward button. If you know, we, if you think about like, you can't fast forward grief, you can't fast forward, you know, development. Like our kids don't go from six months old to teenagers overnight, even though it feels like it, like there's stages in between and it's hard and it's messy. And sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be painful, but the growth happens in that middle of the mess, it doesn't happen by trying to avoid it. All it does is creates dysfunction. And so way in the messy middle is really about normalizing that human experience, normalizing the discomfort, giving people tools and skills to tend to that inner game so that they don't armor up, so they can show up effectively, so they can recognize their narratives that are self-limiting and don't serve them well and therefore don't serve others well. So it's really all that inner game work, honestly. Um, and it's hard to do that if you don't have a fearless environment, by the way, right, that, that feels safe to enter there. And then show up as a leader. We actually define leadership as maximizing our positive impact by becoming our best fully authentic selves and supporting those around us to break past barriers and step into their greatness. So while there are people who have formal people leadership roles, let's be honest, you and I know people who have the title and the role and they are not a leader. I, no way, no, no how. And we know people who don't have that title or role and they are 100% a leader. And so we look at leadership is more about a behavior than a title or role. And that really, are we developing everybody to show up as leaders, to speak up, to take initiative, to maximize their positive impact, to show up authentically and not armored, which again, you can't show up as a leader if you haven't waited in the messy middle and if you don't have a fearless environment to do so. And then the last find your tribe, this is really about 
seeking out people who are different than you. So this might, this is where, you know, inclusion and belonging comes in. This is about building community. This is about building relationships because culture is not HR's responsibility or the CEO's, it's everybody's. And, and it's interesting about the find your tribe because tribalism has a bad connotation, obviously. But if you go back to the ancient roots of the word, it was really about people who have your back. And so the find, find your tribe principle is all about intentionally seeking out others, broadening your relationships, broadening your networks, opening your eyes, and really building a human um, community. I think any one of us can do that. Reach out to a neighbor who you disagree with, someone politically who you disagree with, someone who's a different gender or orientation or race, and just start to go, what is it like to be you? And I think any one of us can start to do that and start to humanize the person that we might be dismissing or judging. Yeah. Wow. I mean, there's just so much there. Um, so beautiful really great guiding principles. I mean, man, even if we could just do a few of those consistently well, <laughs> it would make such a big difference in every last organization that we're involved in. Um, so let's, I hope everyone listening can recommit to, I, I think we all have good intentions, um, but let's recommit to doing some of these basic things. N none of what you just said is rocket science. No, All of it no. is very doable. We can start doing it today. We, we just need to check ourselves. We need to be consistent. Uh, we need, like you said, we just need to make the choice, you know, realize where we're at and make the choice that we're going to bring those principles into action today and how we interact with our people. And if we can do that consistently, it, things will change, things will get better. Uh, and the lives of our people will improve uh, and we'll have a more sustainable team. We'll have, people won't be burning out. Uh, people can, can continue to be productive uh, on an ongoing basis. So it's a win-win for everybody. Um, Rosie, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. Before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, your book, uh, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure being here. So my personal professional website is drrosieward.com. I've got blogs and this will be on there. Um, our book as well as my own podcast, Show Up as a Leader. On Instagram and Facebook, it's Dr. Rosie Ward. I'm also on LinkedIn. And then our company website is Salveo Partners. Dot com. And so that's where we have a lot of our consulting and workshop and leadership development. So you can reach me via both places. And I just think if there's one thing I can impart on people is recognizing that regardless of whether or not you have a good formal leader or not, we all, like you just said, we all have the opportunity to choose each and every day to show up as a leader in our life. So with our family, with our community, as well as at work. And I think if we are showing up and treating others well and showing up as our authentic selves, we inadvertently give other people permission to do the same. And we can start to kind of have that ripple effect. And I think that it's going to take a village of kick-ass leaders to, to shift the trajectory of dehumanized workplaces. So everybody can be part of that movement or that revolution, if you will, um, if, if they choose to. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Rosie. It has been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected, to find out more about Salveo Partners, your book, uh, all the work, good work that you're doing. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.